Hi, my name is Sergey Levin, and today I'm going to talk about the case for real-world reinforcement learning. Um, let's start with a little anecdote. In 1996, the uh, world champion at chess was defeated for the first time by a computer called Deep Blue. And this is a photograph of that uh, historic match. You can see uh, Garry Kasparov uh, on the left there, and on the right you have the computer. And of course, something you might have noticed is that the that there's an actual person playing the game with Garry Kasparov. Uh, the computer is not moving the pieces, but the computer is deciding on the moves. If we fast forward 20 years in 2016, a computer for the first time defeats uh, the world champion at Go. But if we pan the camera out a little bit, we see that, again, there is a person there uh, playing the game. The computer is deciding the moves, but the person is moving the pieces. To me, these photographs vividly illustrate uh, one of the uh, most fundamental principles of uh, AI development over the past few decades, which is Moravec's paradox. Uh, here is a, a concise summary of Moravec's paradox uh, described by Hans Moravec. Uh, we are all prodigious Olympians in the perceptual and motor areas. So good that we make the difficult look easy. Abstract thought, though, is a new trick, perhaps less than 100,000 years old. We have not yet mastered it. It is not all that intrinsically difficult. It just seems so when we do it. Another way to state this, and this is a more recent rephrasing, the main lesson of 35 years of AI research is that the hard problems are easy and the easy problems are hard. The mental abilities of a four-year-old that we take for granted, recognizing a face, lifting a pencil, walking across a room, answering a question, in fact solve some of the hardest engineering problems ever conceived. What this means is that many of the things that seem difficult to us, like playing chess and Go, may not in fact actually be all that difficult whereas things we take for granted, like moving our bodies or doing perception, are in fact very challenging. Now, Moravec's paradox seems like a statement about AI, uh, but it's actually a statement about the physical universe. It's a property of the universe that we inhabit that these uh, perceptual and motor behaviors are so difficult while abstract thought is comparatively easier. And we could imagine that there are some easy universes where this is not the case, and some hard universes where it is. So easy universes, by this uh, notion of easy, would be chess and go, and also a lot of problems in engineering, like, for example, planning the trajectory of a rocket. Um, these are also problems that have been attacked very successfully with computational techniques. Hard universes are more like the ones that we live in, ones that are populated with many agents that have messy physical rules, that have a great deal of diversity and variability. And it's exactly these hard universes that I think reinforcement learning is so well adapted to tackle. But it's also the, this is also where we've actually seen comparatively less research in recent years. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, well, uh, another example that I might give you that's a little closer to uh, the engineering disciplines and might illustrate uh, what's really going on. Imagine uh, that you, your job is to automate the operations of oil tankers. Well, it's not actually too bad to imagine designing an AI system that will automatically navigate your oil tanker around the world. That's not actually that difficult of a problem. But you might still want to have some people on board that oil tanker, because if something breaks, if something unexpected happens, you want somebody to, to go down to the engine room and fix it up. It's not the complexity, the precision of the navigational planning, uh, or any of these other seemingly cognitively complex tasks that demand people's attention. It's the unexpected and messy things that might come about. And this word unexpected, that's actually key. Um, how do we engineer a system that can deal with the unexpected? Some of you may be familiar with the story of Robinson Crusoe. It's a, a novel about, among other things, a man who is uh, stranded on an island and has to fend for himself. One of the interesting things about the story is the inventiveness with which he comes up with various contrivances and devices to further his own survival. Imagine that you have to uh, develop software for an autonomous agent that will be stranded on an island by itself and it will have to fend for itself. You have minimal external supervision about what to do. Unexpected situations will come up that require adaptation and you have to discover solutions autonomously. How can you do that? You don't know what's on the island. You don't know what sort of situations your agent will encounter and it's going to stay lo alive long enough to discover those solutions, so uh, it won't be able to learn through trial and error for millions and millions of trials. This is something that people are remarkably good at, because we have to be. That's what evolution prepared us for. And while it might seem that these are exactly the kinds of problems that uh, learning-enabled agents should be able to tackle, they present a pretty significant challenge. 
Humans are extremely good at this, and current AI systems are extremely bad at this. RL in principle, however, can do this, and I would go so far as to claim that basically nothing else can. If you have minimal external supervision about what to do, if you have to deal with unexpected situations, supervised learning won't cut it. You can't engineer a system in advance with hand-designed planning algorithms. You can't simulate those situations. You can't use sim to real training to figure out how to survive on an island where you'll encounter things that you didn't expect. You have to be able to learn and adapt. So what's the problem? If RL in principle can do this and nothing else can, uh, why uh, isn't this exactly where RL methods will thrive? The problem is that we almost never study this kind of setting in RL research. Remember what I said about easy and hard universes. Easy universes are ones where success corresponds to getting high reward. These are the kinds of problems that we would call optimal control problems. They're often closed world environments, the world of chess or the world of Go, where you don't have to worry about somebody spilling coffee on the Go board. Uh, you can use lots of simulation. You can exhaustively simulate a huge range of different uh, situations you might encounter in these closed world environments. And even if you are using model-free learning, the fact that you have, you have access to a simulator means that you do know the rules. The main question that people ask in these easy universes is, can our algorithms optimize really well? Can they reach superhuman performance? Can they play Atari better than a person can? Can they beat the world champion at chess? In the hard universes, success means survival. It's not about being optimal, it's about being good enough. There are open world settings where everything has to come from data, and there is no simulation because the rules are unknown. The main question there is not whether you can uh, perform better than a person. The main question is, can you survive at all? Can you generalize and can you adapt? I think it's these hard universes that we should be applying RL to, because in these settings, RL is the only thing that I think could work. RL should be really good in the hard universes, but we don't typically study it there. As an aside, one of the things I want to discuss here is the difference between algorithmic and naturalistic claims in science. So algorithmic claims would be claims of this sort. My method converges. My method reaches optimal performance with error that shrinks at some rate. My method requires fewer samples than a prior method. These are claims about your algorithm. You can also imagine naturalistic claims. These are claims about the world, about nature. My method can control a robot in open world environments. My method can drive a car on a busy city street. My method can allow Robinson Crusoe to survive on a desert island. The algorithmic claims are statements about your method in a general and abstract sense. These are statements that you would like to apply, ideally as universally as possible. The naturalistic claims are really statements about our universe and how your method interacts with it. The statement that my method can control a robot in an open world environment is really about our, our world. Maybe there's some other world where this problem is very different. A lot of AI research is about turning naturalistic questions into algorithmic questions. Uh, that's what a lot of our data sets and benchmarks do. The ImageNet data set turns the algorithmic question, does my method outperform another method on ImageNet, into a naturalistic question, because if ImageNet is representative of the real world, then methods that perform better there should also be methods that perform better in our universe. But we still need to make sure that the work we're doing really connects to these naturalistic questions. And certainly in reinforcement learning, I do not think that we've done a very good job of doing that. The big question is, are the current RL advances making our methods better in terms of the hard universe challenges? Are we making progress in the right direction? Uh, are we going to be able to survive on that uninhabited uh, or deserted or simply unexpected island? How are real world problems different from simulator problems? So these, these are some simulator problems. They're generally formulated as episodic. I don't want to understate the importance of continual learning research, but most RL problems we study in benchmarks are episodic, meaning that you try them, then you reset and you try again. It's as though you get to live your life all over again. When you die in Space Invaders, you simply respawn and play again. They're stationary, meaning the rules of the world don't change over time. You don't have to worry that um, the knight will get tired of being a knight, start moving like a bishop, and the game will depend on them like it does on the king. That's not how the rules of chess work. They're closed world environments, uh, meaning that uh, the rules are self-contained, external influences don't creep in and change stuff. And you have prior knowledge that is encoded via a simulator. Even if you learn uh, with the model-free methods, you still know that you have that simulator to access, and that makes certain assumptions seem very natural that would otherwise be very bizarre in the real world. Starting from scratch and getting high reward is key in these environments because, you know, if you were to already start with lots of prior knowledge uh, about how to, you know, play Atari games, it kind of removes a lot of the challenge. 
Uh, again, this is not always the case. There's certainly value in getting the very best performance at a board game by using all the prior knowledge available to you, but generally what fo people focus on in these settings is learning from scratch. In contrast, a lot of real-world tasks are generally continual. Uh, if you are writing prescriptions, doing inventory management, repairing electronics, or surviving on an island, you don't get to just push a button and reset the world back to the way it was. Uh, you have to retry uh, by rearranging the world so that you can try again, or else live entirely in a continual setting. They're non-stationary and evolving. Things change over time, and you have to be robust to unexpected changes. You can't hope to master the entire uh, repertoire of real-world outcomes in such detail that uh, you never have to deal with uh, being robust to unexpected changes. They're open-world settings, and prior knowledge has to be gleaned from prior data. I don't mean to imply with my uh, island analogy that we need to have agents that always learn everything de novo. It's okay to uh, acquire prior knowledge, but in the real world that prior knowledge usually doesn't come in the form of known rules and simulators. It comes in the form of prior data. Quite simply, we don't know the rules of survival on an island, but we might have prior experiences that teach us useful skills and we have to leverage that data. So starting from reasonable priors and getting generalization is key. It's really about how well you do in those unexpected situations rather than how pure you are in getting there uh, fully uh, from scratch on your own. So some questions that we don't usually study. How do we tell our real agents what we want them to do? This is never an issue, for example, in video games, you have a score, you maximize the score, but it's a big question in the real world. How do you define reward functions? How do you evaluate success? How can you learn autonomously in continual environments? Let's say you have a very simple task for your uh, robot to do. Uh, make a coffee. Well, when you spill the coffee, uh, when you flip over the coffee cup, you have to now clean up before you can try again. The world is continual, and if you do want to try repeatedly, you have to take actions yourself to facilitate that. How do you remain robust as the environment changes around you? If you have a, a robotic manipulation task and suddenly the lighting changes or the background changes, how do you deal with that? How does your autonomous car deal uh, with a situation where suddenly the rules of the road change because of construction? What is the right way to generalize using experience and prior data? What if instead of trying to start from scratch and learn a task in one go, we have a data set of past uh, interactions, just like Robinson Crusoe had past experience to draw on, but still had to adapt and figure things out on his own when confronted with the unexpected? And what is the right way to bootstrap exploration from this prior experience? Can you take that prior experience and figure out what things to try in a new setting? I do want to emphasize at this point that these questions are not just about robots. Robots are just the most natural for us to think about because they're embodied in the real world, just like we are. So it's much easier for us to make these analogies. But I think the same questions, just sometimes in a different incarnation, will hold in a range of other real-world domains, from more abstract settings and operations that we research, like inventory management, to medical prescriptions, to chatbots. These are all settings that have to uh, uh, interact with real-world constraints, including continuous uh, interaction, robustness, and so on. And these questions will come up there as well. But in this talk, the examples I'll give you are from robotics, because that's a topic of my research, and because robots really are the most natural analogy uh, for ourselves. So let's start with the first question. How do we specify ta the task? I'm going to give some examples from my own work just to kind of give you some ideas of what research on these questions could look like. In uh, video games, the task is simple. It's to maximize reward. A few years back, we ran some experiments on dexterous manipulation where we tried to train up robotic hands that could perform complex tasks like opening a door. We were very happy with the outcome, uh, but in order to actually evaluate reward, we need to somehow set up our environment to make this possible. So in this case, being a uh, clever engineers, we put in a reel of rope with an encoder motor inside the door uh, that could measure the door angle. Now, this allowed us to run our reinforcement learning experiment, but of course, in my home and probably in your home, uh, we don't have uh, encoders mounted on our door frames, so this robot would not actually be able to learn in those environments. So here's a way we could think about uh, reward specification. What if we think about it with examples? What if we provide the robot with some examples of successful outcomes, in this case, stacking books in a semantically appropriate way, and some examples of failed outcomes? Can we, for example, train a classifier to do this? It's a very reasonable solution. It turns out that doing this naively actually runs into trouble because the RL policy will then take actions that actually fool the classifier. So now this opens up some really interesting avenues of exploration. We could imagine adopting ideas similar to GANs, where we actually robustify the classifier by giving it ne negative labels for all the experience that the robot generates itself. We can even query humans for additional labels actively if we're not certain about the outcome. Um, so my point with this is that 
face confronting this challenge actually opens up this rich tapestry of algorithmic explorations. Um, if we can do this, if we can define these classifier-based rewards, we can do cool tasks like smoothly draping cloth over a box, which are very difficult to define manually. You know, this task really needs to be defined from pixels. Here's another question. How can we learn fully autonomously? How can we not require uh, episodic resets and things like that? Uh, so uh, a couple of years back, my student Anusha Nagabandi carried out some experiments on dexterous manipulation to develop very efficient RL algorithms. So she wasn't really thinking about uh, autonomous learning, she was thinking about efficiency, in this case with model-based RL, and she could get really cool results in simulation, manipulating multiple objects in the hand, writing digits with a pencil. But when we needed to get this to work in the real world, of course, we need to deal with the, what happens when you actually drop those objects, when you drop the pencil, when you drop uh, the bounding balls in this case. Well, what Anusha did as a good engineer is she actually programmed a second robot that would actually reset the task for the robot so that it could try again. It's a pragmatic solution, but of course, again, not something that uh, really exists in naturalistic environments. But here's how we could think about the problem. Let's say that you want to use a coffee machine to make coffee. You have, you have a task, which is to put the cup in the coffee machine. If you fail at that task, a person could come in and fix it. But instead, what if you have a second task, which is to pick up the cup? So if you fail on the first task, you try the second one. If you succeed, then maybe you have to replace the cup. And if you fail at that and you spill the coffee, now you have another task, which is to clean up the coffee spill. So each failure here in this non-episodic setting actually gives you an opportunity to practice a different behavior. Now, here's a concrete instantiation of this uh, from a paper by Abhishek Gupta. Uh, here, the goal is to learn an in-hand manipulation task, a slightly different one, to put this object in the palm and then reposition it in the palm so that it is oriented in a very particular way. So there's the complete task. Well, what we did in this work is we actually defined a graph of tasks, and not for making coffee, for something a bit simpler. And each task in this graph follows from some other task. So you can move the object around on the table, pick it up, flip it over, and reposition it in the palm. And if you define enough of these tasks, then this graph becomes closed, and then you can learn everything fully autonomously. So you can turn on the robot, go home, and the robot starts practicing. And you can see that initially, it practices the easier task. Initially, it practices repositioning the object on the table, then it starts practicing to pick it up, then it starts practicing reorienting, and then it starts practicing repositioning in the hand. So by defining more tasks, by making the problem in some sense harder, uh, we can actually make it fully autonomous. The same principle can be applied to other tasks. Here, the robot is learning to pick up this pipe connector and plug it in. Uh, if it fails, it can just trigger a different task and try again. So having multiple tasks at the same time actually facilitates autonomous learning. This is not something that we likely would have thought of if we were not trying to get this to work in the real world. So the main idea is that learning multiple tasks simultaneously can allow agents to learn entirely autonomously. And again, these are all examples in robotics, but I think the basic principles apply more generally because the fact that our universe can't be reset with a push of a button is a property of the real world. Any real world problem will have that. Um, we've applied similar principles to other domains. This is a, on the left is a walking robot that is learning to walk on a new surface. And again, it's automatically standing up uh, when it falls. On the right is a cleanup robot that is learning to pick up all the objects on the floor. Uh, and it practices by putting those objects back down in different places so they can try again. Can we remain robust as things change? So here's a, a thought exercise. Let's say that you train up a robotic system to grasp objects, and it's very good at grasping all sorts of different objects. But then at test time, it sees something that it didn't expect. Maybe it sees some transparent objects that are really hard to handle, that are just outside of the distribution of what it trained on. Well, perhaps what we can do uh, is we can use our initialization from before and keep learning. One of the big strengths of reinforcement learning is that it is, in a sense, an unsupervised procedure. As long as you can evaluate the reward function, you can just keep training with RL, and your system will keep getting better and better. And that's actually really, really powerful. So without really doing anything fancy, you can keep training. Uh, and you can adapt this grasping system, in this case, to harsh lighting, transparent bottles, checkerboards, and even morphological changes, like changing the shape of the gripper. In this case, the uh, prior trading data, the base data set for this, consisted of uh, 600,000 episodes collected over several months. And that was the prior knowledge for the system. Adaptation to many of these tasks took only about four hours. Um, so here's a, a video of this in action. Uh, the initial system has a success rate of 86%. And then as things change in the environment, as, for example, we introduce different kinds of objects, lighting, and so on, the success rate is going to drop. Um, so here we have harsh lighting, it drops to 32% after fine tuning, goes back, back up to 
And we can, in fact, instantiate this as a lifelong system. We can observe these changes one at a time, adapt to each one in turn, and become better collectively at the entire range of different perturbations. So not only does this present interesting challenges, it also presents interesting opportunities that if we uh, sequence this lifelong setting, you actually gain more robustness as you go. Uh, can we get better generalization from leveraging prior data? So what if we have agents that have collected large data sets of past interactions that they're going to use to train for each new task they face? So instead of learning entirely through exploration, they're going to train up the best policy they can from their past data and then occasionally get more data to improve. This motivates the development of methods that go beyond on-policy RL and actually instantiate offline reinforcement learning, where you use your past data to learn the best policy for a new task. That gets you a really good starting point fully offline, and then only then do you explore a little bit more. Um, so I mentioned these grasping systems that we had built at Google. More recently, we extended them to a multitask setting with 12 different tasks, thousands of objects, and months of data collection. This is a system that we call MTOpt. And then later on, we had a new hypothesis we wanted to test. The hypothesis was, could we learn uh, all these tasks without any rewards by using goal-conditioned RL? And we wanted to evaluate this hypothesis without incurring the same cost of having to collect new data for months and months. Well, one thing we could do is we could reuse all the data we already had with offline reinforcement learning and adapt it to this new problem formulation. And that was interesting for a few reasons that pertain to this talk. The first is that we could actually get a very generalizable robotic policy that could achieve different goals commanded by the user. So the lower right corner here shows a picture of the goal the user commanded here. The goal is to pick up the carrot and to hold the carrot. There's no reward function. Uh, it's just a, a reward of plus one if you match the goal perfectly and zero otherwise. And it uses a conservative offline RL method based on a technique we developed called CQL. Besides showing how prior data can be leveraged for generalization, it also illustrates an interesting principle. We can use these goal-conditioned objectives as an unsupervised pre-training objective to acquire tasks more quickly. So you can train a goal-conditioned Q function with offline RL, and then you can fine-tune with a task reward and limited data. Almost like BERT can be used to pre-train an NLP and then fine-tune for di different tasks very rapidly, this method, called actionable models, can be used to pre-train in an unsupervised way and then fine-tune more rapidly to downstream tasks when reward is available. So all that prior data is giving you the superior power of generalization and initializing subsequent downstream adaptation. So these goal condition policies are a good way to encapsulate the prior knowledge. Um, can you more directly bootstrap exploration from prior experience? Can we actually do the exploration itself more intelligently? Well, imagine that you put a robot in a, some new environment and you run an RL algorithm from scratch. Probably on the first few episodes, it'll do something like this. It'll essentially move the arm randomly, uh, perform random motions until it accidentally does something relevant to the task, gets some reward, and then improves from there. But what if you do have data from many prior tasks? Perhaps you can use it to explicitly train a behavioral prior, a kind of model that encapsulates the things that could be done for potentially useful behaviors. This behavior pri behavioral prior is not telling you what to do to solve the new task. It's just giving you the space of possibilities. It's basically telling you that, well, touching and picking up objects is probably a useful thing in manipulation settings. Uh, formally, we can view this behavioral prior as a reparameterization of the action space that takes random variables and maps them to actions that could be useful. So if you actually run this behavioral prior in the same environment, it'll do things like this. It doesn't know what the task is. It's starting uh, without any knowledge of this particular task, but it has seen prior tasks and it knows that regardless of what the task is, it probably involves interacting with those objects in some way, so it starts randomly trying to touch them and trying to move them around. And this approach that we call Parrot is very, very effective at speeding up a huge range of vision-based tasks. So these are all tasks learned with RL from images, but using this multitask behavioral prior. Uh, and it can learn effectively on a very wide range of objects in a, in a huge range of different settings. So I talked about these questions. How do we tell RL agents what we want them to do? How can we learn fully autonomously in continual environments? How do we remain robust as the environment changes around us? And what is the right way to generalize using experience and prior data and the right way to bootstrap exploration with prior experience? These are not the only questions that we're faced with when we have to get RL to work in the real world. But remember what I said before. It's not about optimal control. It's about good enough control. It's about survival. It's about adapting to an unfamiliar setting quickly enough to be useful. These are very different considerations than maximizing reward in a narrow simulated setting. These are not questions that can be answered uh, by transfer from simulation because you can't simulate the unexplored island that you've never been to. These are not questions that can be leveraged uh, by getting the best performance on Atari games. These are questions that pertain to the real universe, the hard universe. These are naturalistic questions. 
So I think that this presents challenges, but it also presents an enormous opportunity. And if we study reinforcement learning uh, as it applies to the real world, we can make progress on this and actually get methods that can adapt like Robinson Crusoe. So what's the point of all this? Why is this story interesting? Well, besides the technical challenges, it's exciting to see what solutions intelligent agents come up with. It's most exciting if they come up with something that we don't expect. And this requires that the world they inhabited mid-novel solutions. It means the world has to be complicated. To see interesting emergent behavior, we have to train our systems in environments that actually require interesting emergent behavior. RL in the real world may be difficult, but it's also far more rewarding. Thank you for listening.